try to not get in anybody's way, but if I you can't see, let me know and I'll try to readjust. But um, essentially what we're going to uh, present tonight is, is an overview of the study that we've, that we've been working on for, um, what, about a year, maybe even um, a bit over a year now. Um, and so what, we, what the point of the study was was to take a look at the transit services that are operating uh, here in Ulster County to see um, where, what the strengths are, what some of the uh, issues are that we think we can improve. Um, and to present it all sort of a, in, in a comprehensive uh, picture. So tonight we're going to talk about some lessons learned from the study. Um, we're going to introduce a few guiding principles for transit service. These are, these are uh, principles that apply really uh, globally to transit, not specifically to any agency, but they're principles that can be applied um, to transit uh, wherever it exists. And we'll talk about some specific recommendations um, here in Ulster County. And uh, we'll talk even a little bit about the case for, for potential integration between the two systems that do exist here in Ulster County. So first of the lessons learned. Uh, the first thing that we noticed, um, and the first thing that anybody knows is really when they look at, at the map of, of transit in, in the county is that geographically the county is pretty well served, well covered by, by transit. Um, but when you look more closely, <coughs> you see that although geographically the coverage is pretty broad, it suffers a little bit in terms of frequency of service. Um, and, and so what that means is some, some trips, some routes are served just a handful of times a day. Um, when you have a scenario like that, it, it, te it's, it tends to meet the needs of the most transit dependent uh, people in, in the county, but it's tough to appeal to choice riders who value um, frequency of service and, and, and things like that. So it's a bit of a trade-off. Um, you, you know, it's important to have broad coverage because there is transit demand in all, county, in all corners of the county, um, but sometimes uh, frequency does suffer. So that was one of the lessons that we, we learned. Um, another lesson that we learned is that, this is closely related to the previous one, but UCAT and City Bus are trying to accomplish quite a bit with limited resources. Um, in other words, both agencies are, are somewhat stretched and, and for kind of different reasons. For City Bus, the main issue is fleet size. Uh, City Bus has uh, a fleet of four transit buses Really, it's five, four, four modern transit buses. And they, do you guys still have the back, the, uh, the, the backup bus that's two, two, two trolley, two, two trolley buses? So four, four modern uh, transit buses and then two trolleys that sort of serve as, as backup. Um, UCAT, UCAT's issue is is not so much fleet size because their fleet is in the what, 24 bus range. Is that still active? <coughs> and 20, 27 now. Uh, but the, the main issue is the enormous service area that that uh, UCAT has has to serve. So it's, it's a similar issue um, in, in terms of both of them are a little bit stretched uh, thin, but for kind of different reasons. Another lesson uh, that we learned from, from surveys, and we did um, pretty comprehensive surveys of, of both riders and non-riders, uh, what we found, especially from riders, is that riders want more service, and that may not be much of a surprise, but um, the overall perception of the people that we surveyed was that service in some cases is not frequent enough, in another case it, it doesn't run when, when they would like it to run, and, and for example, no weekend service, no evening service, um, things like that. So, so that was a common theme that we saw from rider surveys. Um, another, another issue, that, another lesson that, that was learned is that travel patterns uh, transcend, and interest in, tri in, in trips transcend municipal boundaries. Um, what that means is that you know, somebody that, that lives in Kingston, for example, they, they don't mentally limit their interest to the city of Kingston. If, if, if there's some retail destination that's outside the city of Kingston, they, those people still would like to, to reach those destinations. So, so political boundaries are somewhat arbitrary uh, as far as transit users go. Um, so that was, that was an important lesson that we learned as well. Um, and then another, another lesson that we, that we saw is that at the time of the study, and by the way, I should mention that since we've, uh, since the study has essentially concluded, um, a lot of the issues that we identified have already been, or have begun to be addressed um, by, by the transit agencies. And, um, I encourage them actually, if, if, if I mention something that was an issue and now it, it is no longer an issue, feel free to, to, to state that because this is uh, an example. Uh, I believe this might be an example. So neither, when we were doing the study, neither UCAD nor City Bus offered information about each other on the printed materials. So um, the, the situation here was that, you know, those riders were familiar with the transit systems, the, both transit systems, that had, had, that had long been navigating the county using 
one or, or both systems knew how they interconnected. But uh, for new passengers, it could be intimidating, especially if they don't have the information uh, readily available to them. It could be intimidating to figure out how to navigate between, between systems. Um, another lesson learned is, is that um, uh, th those people that, that filled out surveys, in some cases, we asked, we asked them, what destination would you like served that, that are not already served? And interestingly enough, we found that in many cases, uh, people would, s would mention a destination that actually was served, but not with the system that they are most familiar with. In other words, a lot, of, a lot of transit users are familiar either with one system or the other, but for whatever reason, they aren't uh, making themselves familiar with both. So there's some sort of maybe psychological barrier, or it's, it's hard to say what exactly, but uh, s some users of, of, of these two systems are not always crossing these, these boundaries. Um, and then another lesson that we learned was that um, both systems' current approach, at least at the time, to data collection made it a little bit difficult to uh, pinpoint areas of unproductive service. Um, in, in other words, um, in, when you're doing an analysis of transit service, you want to know wh where routes are, which routes are productive and where they're productive. So that you could have a route that, that seems to be unproductive on paper in whole, but then when you look at it very closely, you see there's portions of the route that's actually very productive and other portions of the route that, that are less productive. But unless you set up a data collection system to identify specifically areas that are more or less productive, it's hard to, to pinpoint those areas. If you can't pinpoint where things are productive, it's hard to address those issues. And at the time when we were doing this, this uh, study, uh, neither system was, was really collecting data at the stop level um, to the point that they could you know, track productivity uh, at that finite of, of a level. But we are. We, but but that's one of the issues that has been addressed. Uh, UCAT has now started doing that. So the, the, the next thing that uh, I want to present are, are some guiding principles to transit service design. And the point of this is that you know, our, our contract here is, is going to end, but we, we want to leave uh, the transit agencies with, with principles that will guide them you know, long into the future. These are, these are very broad, general principles that make transit more appealing to users in general. So these principles, as, as, all, as all principles, you're not going to be able to apply them 100%. I mean, so, so because, of, you know, the, the, because of real world conditions, there will be times when some, some of these principles just simply are impossible to implement, but nevertheless, um, they're important to keep in mind. So ser service should operate at regular intervals. That's, that's the first one. Um, and the reason behind that is people in general can easily remember repeating patterns, um, but they have difficult, uh, difficulty remembering schedules that are, that are very irregular. Um, not only is it difficult to remember, but, but people end up having to carry on timetables and so on. It makes the service less appealing, less attractive to riders. So to the extent possible, if you can make a regular frequency, you know, buses run every 30 minutes, buses run every hour, and so on, uh, it's, it's a more appealing system. <coughs> um, routes should operate along the direct path. What this means is the fewer directional changes that a route makes, the easier it is to understand. Once you have a route that's very circuitous, um, it's difficult, especially difficult, to track new riders because they'll pick up a map, they pick up the schedule, and they see something that looks like spaghetti, and they just uh, are a little bit intimidated, and, and it, it's difficult to appeal to, to those uh, new users. Um, it's also somewhat disorienting when you're on the bus and you're trying to follow you know, along on the schedule, and if, if it's circuitous, it's, it's very difficult for, for riders to follow along. Um, that doesn't mean that, that buses should always you know, take a direct path. If there's a good reason to deviate, let's say if there's a major employer, if there's a hospital, if there's a major retail center, yes, it makes sense to deviate. But to the extent possible, it's better to have the, the most direct path possible. Routes should be symmetrical. Um, what this means is that um, if a person goes from point A to point B and they want to return, uh, to the extent possible, they should be able to just cross the street and go right back the way they came. Essentially, the way that people drive or the way that people walk should also be the way that people use transit, um, as opposed to transit that, come, that takes one path you know, from point A to point B and takes a completely different path back from point B to point A. Um, that can, again, be disorienting passengers. Of course, it's not always possible because there are scenarios with one-way streets. Um, there, are, there are issues with uh, turn radii and, and things like that. So it's not always possible to have completely symmetrical service, but to the extent possible, that improves passenger experience. Uh, routes
routes should be uh, well-defined, or they should serve well-defined markets. Um, what that means is it's always helpful to have strong anchors on, on a route. Um, for example, a route could go from Kingston to Saugerties. You know, that, that makes sense to people. Kingston is a strong uh, anchor, Saugerties is, is, is a strong anchor. If a route just sort of peters out in the middle of, you know, of nowhere, it, it's, it's a little bit harder for people to remember, oh yeah, that's the, you know, Kingston, if people remember, that's the Kingston route but they won't remember a route that ends you know, next to a pasture or something like that. So it's important to, to have well-defined markets. Um, service should be well-coordinated. Uh, that, that is maybe a no-brainer, but what that means is when you have multiple routes um, that, that come together at, at a transit center or some other, other point, uh, it's best to have their schedules uh, correspond so that passengers don't have to have excessive wait time to transfer from one route to another. Um, this, has, this doesn't only have to do with routing and scheduling, it also has to do with things like uh, fare policy and so on, so that a, a person that is making a transfer from one system to the other can do so relatively seamlessly, rather than you know, having to pay, basically start over with every new system that they, that they uh, transfer to. So coordination is, is important. So now we'll move on to um, some recommendations, specific recommendations uh, here in Ulster County um, that that we um, would like to recommend for, for the two transit systems. So the first one um, is improving passenger information. And this starts, again, with, with kind of coordination and standardization. Right now, um, City Bus and UCAT have, have very different formats for their passenger information. Uh, th this one here is a UCAT schedule. This one here is a City Bus schedule. They take different, different formats. And in part, this may be one of the reasons that, um, that users sort of stick to one system or the other, because once you get one system, um, it's, it's somewhat maybe difficult to reorient yourself to a different system if it uses a completely uh, different format and approach to, to passenger information. So we would recommend uh, standardizing the format of passenger schedules and, and information between the two systems. Um, in the case where there is interlining, what interlining means is Sometimes a bus starts on one route, and then when it gets to a certain point, it becomes a new route. It just changes its head sign, and it continues on to, to a different route. Um, passengers, the benefit of that for passengers is that they get what's called a one-seat connection. So it used to be that between Kingston and Saugerties, there were two, two routes, the uh, S route and the K route. Um, but passengers could actually stay on one bus and get from Saugerties to Kingston or Kingston to, to Saugerties. Um, but not everybody knew about that. So what we recommend is that on passenger schedules, you note that you know, at this point, the route will continue on to, from the S to the K or the K to the S. And you, you, you know, if you're a passenger, you know you can stay on a bus and you don't have to transfer. Um, I believe that's one of the things that has now been implemented by, by UCAT. So this is uh, an important feature. Um, another recommendation that we made was to essentially join the, the Google Transit Partnership Program. Uh, is anybody familiar with Google Transit? I'm sure everyone's familiar with Google Maps, right? So Google Transit is, is sort of a, a feature of Google Maps in many communities. Um, essentially, if you, if, you are, if you have a smartphone or even a computer and you pull up Google Maps, um, you can zoom, if you zoom in, you'll close enough, you'll see bus stops and you'll see transit information on Google Maps. So for that information to be on Google, the transit system has to make that available to Google. Um, here in New York State, there's a process where transit agencies can work with the Department of Transportation through the 511 system to get information to, to Google and, uh, and, and all up on Google Maps. And I believe you guys have done that or are doing that? We're, we're working on that. You're working on that, okay. This is important because, again, the more information passengers have, the more, the more sort of accessible the transit system becomes, the less intimidating it is. There's always a fear of the unknown with transit that somebody's gonna get on the wrong bus and end up who knows where. So this, this helps uh, solve some of, some of that fear of the unknown. Another recommendation um, is improving passenger information, installing bus stops, installing and maintaining bus stop signs. When we started this program, UCAT had a, what's called a flag stop system. The flag stop, stop system is one in which um, anyone can essentially flag the bus down anywhere along, along its route. So you just step out onto the, onto the road, bus is passing by, you flag it down, hopefully he's, the driver sees you, he stops and he picks you up and, and off you go. That is a system that again is good for seasoned riders because, because they kind of have a good sense of when a bus is coming and where the bus is coming. It's, 
very difficult to track new riders into that system because it's very intimidating. You, 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 you step out there, you don't know if the bus is coming, you, may, you don't know if you're in the right place. Bus stop signs give uh, a sense of comfort to new users that yes, I'm in the right place, and yes, I'm here at the right time. So this is something that UCAT is now doing. Uh, or yeah, it's, in. it's in, it has, it has been done. So um, the, the other issue with bus stop signs, it's one thing to put them in, it's another thing to, to maintain them. And, um, the, the trick to maintaining them is if, you, if the information on the signs is too specific, um, it creates a barrier to change. And what I mean by that is if you put all the schedule information pre-printed on a, on a metallic sign, then there's a lot of resistance to ever change the schedule because you invested in these signs um, with, with pre-printed schedules. So a, a different approach is to have the more long-term long information, like the route, the, the system name, the route number, for example, on the metallic part, and then have a separate area for schedules that can be quickly and easily changed out, like paper schedules can be put into um, a display board. Uh, so that, you know, ma ma installing is one part and ma maintaining is another. So that's something for the future to, to, to consider when you um, are putting up bus stop signs, how you design them. Um, service standards. Service standards are important because when an agency invests in, in transit service, um, that agency and, and everyone that's associated with the taxpayers that help support that agency um, should want to know what, what is the result of my investment. Um, we've just invested, you know, X amount of money into a route. Uh, is the ridership increasing or is the ridership decreasing? Should we continue pouring money into that route or should we consider pouring money into some other route? And so that's where s service standards come in. If you set standards for things like productivity, things like ridership for, for revenue hours, um, you, can, you can see that, okay, for three quarters, for four quarters, a route has been exceeding standards. So that's great, then maybe we actually increase frequency on that route. On the other hand, if, if a route is not meeting standards, then after a while it should raise a red flag and we should consider, is this route really worth continuing to invest in or do we shift our resources elsewhere? These are just some examples from different agencies. This one is from the Rochester area. This is a bit difficult to see, but they have a, a very intricate matrix of something like a dozen different factors that they measure um, every route against every every month, and then based on the performance along all, all the metrics, and they include things like on-time performance, uh, things like pa uh, overload factors, just a range of things. And then the, they have a priority set, so the route that performs the worst any month is lifted to the top of the priority list for tension. So this is a much simpler system. This is from uh, Washington State Community Transit We're outside of Seattle. They have simply a, a service standard for productivity for boardings per revenue hour, and uh, you, they just look to see how every route is performing against that standard every month. So until service standards are set, um, the, it doesn't mean that you should you know, sit still and do nothing until there are service standards set. Um, there are still many opportunities to improve service that it's really budget neutral and it still can improve ridership. For example, uh, we'll start with, with city bus service in Kingston. Um, in Kingston, currently you have three routes. Um, every one of those routes runs, runs hourly, although in the midday there's an interruption of service for a few hours where there, where there is no, no service. The three routes, for the most part, are one one way one way service so they're sort of large large loops with one way service. Um, the, the issue with one way service is that it, it's difficult to track choice riders again because if a person wants to go kind of back behind where they started, they actually have to go around the entire loop to, to, to go back. So it's a certain the service in Kingston is somewhat circuitous, and so it's primarily appealing to to more transit dependent riders versus versus choice riders. Um, so an alternative to that would be to say, let's not, and I should say, the reason it's, it's as circuitous as it is is because City Bus is trying to cover the most territory in Kingston possible, which is, you know, admirable because everybody in Kingston deserves, deserves transit center, deserves transit service. But at some point, you, you, you have to find a balance saying, you know, do we have maximum coverage or do we have um, decent frequency? And it's sometimes difficult to do both. So we would recommend to focus service on two primary corridors, the uh, Albany corridor and the Broadway corridor, um, to extend service to Hudson Valley Mall. That's, that's the issue that we talked about before, where people's, uh, people's ridership choices extend beyond municipal boundaries in many cases. 
So if, if possible, uh, extend service to the Hudson Valley Mall. Uh, improve service frequency to at least every 40 minutes instead of hourly if possible. Um, allow UCAT to operate open door in Kingston to sort of fill in some of the gaps that would open up by focusing service on these two primary portals. What I mean by open door is UCAT does come into the city of Kingston now, but for the most part, it, it operates through the city without opening its doors until it gets to, to the plat to, uh, to the Hannafords at Kingston Plaza. Um, and the, the, reason, the reason behind this, it's sort of a gentleman's agreement. So at, at, so as not to kind of compete for customers with, with one another, UCAT doesn't allow passengers to board and alight within the city except um, at the plaza. Um, also, we would recommend considering some, some more creative options instead of just uh, fixed route service, like anchored flex service. Um, a good example of this is the Colonial Gardens Apartments. Uh, I'll, I'll actually I have a map of this later, so I'll save that, that thought. But this is kind of a, a rough draft of, of what service along two corridors could look like. Um, so you have the, the Broadway corridor and then the uh, Ulster, Ulster Albany corridor. And it's, it's a much more direct service. There is a deviation uh, every now and then you see like to, to serve the medical centers um, along, along Broadway. Um, but it's, it's definitely focused along these two corridors versus, I don't know if you can see from here, but the dotted lines, the background, the current, the current route structure. Um, there, there's some, currently City Bus does serve uh, Fort Ewan um, and, and that's an important connection. So uh, there's a possibility to instead shift service to the Rondout Landing area, but that could only, a lot, a lot of these recommendations are sort of like a domino effect. Other things must happen in order for these to happen. And so one of the big things that must happen is UCAT must be able to, to fill in some of the gaps. So if UCAT were to provide regular service on the 9W corridor, then that could allow City Bus to, to shift some of their resources to, uh, to the Rondout Landing area rather than going down to Fort Ewan. Uh, another example of that's uh, sort of trade-off, the Golden Hill Complex. Um, the UCAT, UCAT's R route currently does serve the Golden Hill Complex on some trips, um, and mostly trips when, when city bus is not in service. So again, if, if UCAT were allowed to operate here more freely, then there's a possibility that the, the Golden Hill Complex could be served uh, by UCAT and city bus could uh, reallocate resources elsewhere. Similarly, the uh, Stony Run apartments, um, those, those apartments could be served by the UCAT U route, um, which uh, right now runs in the 209 corridor. Um, again, if, if UCAT was able to, to run with open doors through this, through this area, then it would allow uh, City Bus to uh, invest resources elsewhere. Colonial Gardens. So the issue with Colonial Gardens is that they, th this is uh, Albany Avenue here, as all of you probably know, there's a railroad track that, that separates uh, Albany Avenue from Colonial Gardens. Buses tend to get stuck behind uh, trains. And I, I read just today, actually, that the speed limit of these trains is increasing through the city, which will hopefully reduce some of those delays for, for traffic, including buses. Um, but uh, even, even still, there's, I think, what, 35 trains a day that come through Kingston. And so that creates some, some problems in serving Colonial Gardens. So the, the recommendation here is, rather than having Colonial Gardens on a fixed route type of service, have what's called anchored flex service. So that means that there's a time point when a vehicle would serve Colonial Gardens, um, but then the, the path that it takes from Col Colonial Gardens to the plaza would not be defined. So um, you know that you would serve the, the apartment complexes at time A and the plaza at time B, but how you got there would not be defined. And it could be done by a demand responsive vehicle. A demand responsive vehicle is a type of vehicle that typically serves uh, paratransit customers. Paratransit customers are people with disabilities and, and so on. But it's possible to use that vehicle at specific times of the day to provide scheduled service, and then after that trip, it reverts back to, to doing its paratransit service. So that was just an idea to deal with some of the de delays that buses experience um, in serving Colonial Gardens. So in, in general, um, it, it may make sense to consider demand responsive service throughout the city uh, of Kingston. Because the issue in Kingston is, is you do have demand in, in many places, but it's not always dense enough. Um, the, the demand isn't, isn't there in, in quite the numbers to justify having fixed route service all the time, everywhere. So, so instead, you could support a demand response service as I described 
using maybe your existing paratransit vehicles and opening up the eligibility from what it is now, which is just people with medical conditions and, and, and some other issues, to a, to a broader pool of, of people, and then you create a hierarchy. So those people that, have, that do have medical conditions, those people would have first priority, um, but then other people could also use the service if there is availability. Those are primarily the Kingston um, uh, issues. The, the rest of the things in the presentation deal with Ulster County in general, and Dennis, I, I don't know if, um, how we're doing on time, but I could continue with more of the Ulster County. I think we should just very briefly explain the report of recommendations and then run to the end because we have recommendations at the end and the specific proposals. Yeah, okay. So one issue is streamlining Saugies to, to Kingston service. Um, this trip now, uh, this trip when we were doing the survey, took uh, nearly an hour because of the circuitous routing through the mall um, and, and so on. So what we recommended is to uh, have a streamlined uh, routing that, that either, either serves Tech City or the mall, um, and then have the mall circulator shuttle, which, which exists now, essentially be a bridge between Tech City and the mall. So, any, so, so anybody that from Tech City that needs to go to the mall would transfer to the the mall shuttle, or if the uh, route ended up uh, streamlined through the mall, and people need to go to Tech City, then, then the mall shuttle could provide that, that bridge. But essentially, we're trying to speed up the connection between Saugerties and Kingston. Um, minimizing deadhead. What deadhead means is trips, sometimes buses have to be moved just to get to the, to the point from their garage to where they're starting service. That's called deadhead. Deadhead is, is unproductive time, um, and for example, Pine Hill area has uh, pretty significant demand for ridership into Kingston in the morning, starting at 6.15. But buses have to get out there, and so there's a trip that starts in Kingston at 4.55 in the morning just trying to get out to Pine Hill to, to then serve passengers coming into Kingston. If there's a way, if there was a way to store a vehicle out at Pine Hill, then you wouldn't have to have that deadhead movement in the morning. And um, I don't know, if that was being explored. Did you guys ever find a way? Ellenville. Ellenville. Same story with Ellenville. So apparently in Ellenville, they did find a place to store a bus. Pine Hill, not quite yet. All right. Um, another deadhead issue is uh, the U and the E routes on, on, on Saturdays. There was, there, there was service on the E routes on Saturday. The E route is from Ellenville to Ulster County Community College. Um, the, the U route then essentially continues from Ulster County Community College to Kingston. Only one of those ran on weekends, so there was a gap. There was a gap between Kingston and Ulster County Community College, uh, and so because of that, ridership on the portion that did run was quite low, because there was no feed, there, was, there was no way for passengers to feed into the portion that was running. Um, that has been changed, and now there's service all the way from Kingston to Ellenville. Well, it's in draft. We're looking at um, the second start of the second quarter. Okay, so at the start of the second quarter, this, this one will be addressed. Um, cultivating SUNY ridership. Students are among the most receptive uh, market segment of public transportation, and anything you can do to improve service uh, in and around colleges uh, will undoubtedly uh, improve ridership. And so there are ways to cultivate student ridership. Um, in, uh, in New Paltz, uh, we came up with a suggestion to, to streamline service to make it more appealing uh, for students trying to get from campus, from SUNY New Paltz, to areas uh, with student housing or off-campus housing, as well as retail. Um, so this is just a rerouting of the New Paltz uh, loop to improve the appeal of the service. Um, we also recommended creating uh, a route that, that links the two SUNY campuses, uh, uh, New Paltz and, and Ulster. Um, I believe this is now, has it been implemented or it will be? Yeah, April, April 1st. It, it will be implemented April 1st. Um, in improving on-time performance, we found that uh, the, the, the X route, which serves Newburgh, uh, does quite a bit of circulation through Newburgh, um, which was hard to justify because Newburgh has its own uh, municipal transit system. Um, and so we recommended just serving Newburgh at one point, allowing people to transfer to local service in Newburgh if they need to, to make connections in Newburgh. Did, did this? We're, we're still studying this. Okay, so still being studied. Okay, uh, simplifying service. The, um, uh, the UPL, which connects uh, to the Kipsey uh, rail station um, and, and then rail service into into New York City had 
when we started this study, it had 17 different variants. The schedule, almost no two trips were alike, so we recommended uh, essentially whittling it down to just a handful of different, different variants. What a variant is, is sometimes a route uh, on select trips takes a bit of a different path than, than on other trips, um, which is understandable because there are some destinations that, that need to be served, maybe not as often as some other destinations. Um, but having 17 different variants is, is a little bit too much for people to, to comprehend. Okay, finally we'll talk about the, the case for, for integration between, between the two systems. So th there's two main reasons really to, to integrate. One is for the sake of the passengers, um, and to the sake of the, of the passenger experience, to make it a much more seamless environment. Um, and a lot of the changes that we just talked about, they can be done without integration. They can be done in independent of, of one another. Um, but the integration for the passengers, it just removes a lot of arbitrary boundaries. Having to pay uh, a, a transfer fee, having to have two passenger schedules, things like that. The other issue is, is operational. And there's many aspects of the operation on the operational side. Um, issues like fuel, maintenance equipment, administration. Uh, we'll talk about all of those. So fuel, for example, um, Ulster County can purchase 15,000 gallons of fuel at a time, um, whereas the city cannot. And the reason the city can't, it's, it's just purely a, a capacity, a storage and capacity issue. Um, so the, the city's annual fuel cost um, is, is about $90,000. If they could purchase more, more fuel, um, they could re have economies of scale and reduce that uh, to about $70,000. So it, this is just purely an issue of, you know, you can, you can achieve these economies of scale. And not, not only in fuel, um, maintenance as well. I mean, e even issues like um, buying, buying tires, buying spare parts, it, you, all, you usually get a benefit by buying in bulk. Um, and so right now with, with maintenance, the, the staff, the city, city staff in, in Kingston, um, they maintain both the city bus service as well as Department of Public, Public Works service. Um, at the same time, UCAT has built an entire facility that's specifically designed for, for, for maintaining transit, transit buses. If the maintenance for city bus vehicles was done at the UCAT facility, then city bus or Kingston staff could be devoted to uh, focusing on, on other type of maintenance issues, other vehicles, uh, trash trucks, police vehicles, you name it. Um, so so that's, that's an issue there. So it, the savings there are not, not just um, it's not just labor, but it's also expenses. It's expenses because UCAT could assist in buying a lot of these common parts in, in bulk. Uh, equipment, Sa same general issue. Um, you know, there are there are things that it, you have to ask yourself: Does it make sense to have two two of two things like two bus wash um, facilities, two fuel fuel storage facilities, and of course. Kingston is you don't really have a separate fuel storage facility just for city bus because the fuel storage is, is done for all city departments. But again, um, UCAT has has this excess capacity of fuel storage and, and putting that to full use could save, uh, as we mentioned, uh, could, allow, could allow you to buy fuel in, in larger numbers and result in economies of scale. The other issue with equipment is, you know, city bus is, city bus's budget right now is almost completely devoted to operating costs. So the question becomes, when it's time to replace the vehicles, the, the current city bus fleet, what will be the source of, of funds for, for those vehicles? The current round of vehicles was paid for with the um, ARA recovery, recovery funds. No, no? No. How many? Two. Two of the vehicles. Okay, so two of the vehicles were paid for with recovery funds. So when it comes time to replacement, about what, 12, I guess 10 years now? Or and let's say in 10 years, the question is, what are the funds that will be used to, to replace those vehicles? So it's a, it's a legitimate question to consider as well. Um, administration, again, UCAT has built uh, an administration facility and has, has the staff um, on hand that, that um, essentially could very likely absorb a lot of administrative type of duties um, having to do with transit, which could open up uh, city bus staff to take on other city functions if, if that was you know, something that, that the city would consider. Um, UCAT's call center could, could easily absorb the additional uh, call volume for things like paratransit service um, and just customer information if city bus was included in, in their call center. 
the, the fear of, integra of integration often has to do with the sense of losing control, losing local control for a service that's important to, to your community, that's important to your, to your citizens. Um, and here in Ulster County, there is another model <coughs> that, that can be pointed at, and that's New Paltz. New Paltz um, offers an example of how a municipality can, can, can influence the service uh, without actually running it uh, themselves, without actually spending on, on the capital uh, side of it. Um, in New Paltz, UCAT has a very high level of service, um, higher than they would otherwise, because New Paltz, the, the college, the town, uh, the city have, have contributed um, in, in operating assistance to, to UCAT to, to ramp up the level of service. So, so this, this serves as a model um, for, for, for Kingston to show that it is possible to maintain um, local control while not necessarily um, having complete control over the, the operation of the transit system. And that is essentially it, so we can discuss